Hello, my name is Ian, and today we're talking about John Kay's Marion Sykes, Recalling Memories and Making Rugs. This is from a chapter from John Kay's book, uh, what's it called, Folk Art and Aging, um, Life Story Objects and Their Makers. John, who's a friend of mine, is uh, based in Indiana and uh, worked for a long time with the Indiana State Folklore Commission. Uh, and is now at Indiana University, and his area of interest is precisely what the title suggests. Um, uh, the elderly community, uh, or elders in the community who have, uh, who are using and creating folk art, not for some particular market reason, and not because they had always been doing it. It's typically a, a, a something that they take up later in life, and he's very much a He's very much following on the work of Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet and her idea of memory objects, particularly when it comes to Marion Sykes. Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet wrote a sort of classic article in Material Culture Studies called uh, Objects of Memory, a Material Culture as Life Review. I might have that title a little bit odd, but I'll put it on the slide. Uh, and she suggested that we, uh, we, we typically, one of the things that objects do, one of the things that we, um, uh, we often will surround ourselves with objects precisely because they help us to organize and reflect and situate ourselves within within our lives. And so she has this wonderful taxonomy of, of objects. And of course, not every object does this, but if you go into a place, and particularly if you go into the place of, um, if you go into like retirement communities, for example, where you have uh, you know, people who are who are towards the end of their life, and they are engaged in life review and reflection and sort of looking back. They are more reminiscent than they are forward-looking, which is not meant to be in any way uh, uh, dire or, or or depressing. But they're just in this in this process, and uh, they have the leisure, they have the time, and they have the accrued life experiences to try and make sense of it. And often, also, often they are um, absent from their family are absent from memories and, and people who are departed either physically or in, in terms of having uh, having passed away. And so the objects that they surround themselves with um, are often these opportunities to, um, and you can, you can see that they become these opportunities for narration, for reflection, for thinking of their own lives, thinking of their own, um, uh, again, thinking of absent people. So for example, she has, um, she talks about mem uh, mementos, which are um, you know uh, objects that have a memory connection to specific people, typically, and it could just be something as simple as a photograph, or it can be a gift, or you know some kind of tchotchke that doesn't represent anything else save for the person, um, or it could be a souvenir, which is much more a memory of an event. Or, um, or or a place, and because uh, you know what souvenirs are, but let's think about what a souvenir is. And it's like, okay, well, this is this is a an object that I can uh, reflect on. Um, there are pseudo contagious magic properties to it. It's like I get this from this place, and therefore it, it retains a connection to that place. But um, you don't need that. You don't need you don't need Fraser's sympathetic magic to understand that the souvenir is um, uh, it, it can be a prompt for memory. And then if you have like an entire collection of things, uh, you know, in a, an assembly of things, then you sort of start to have you know, think about like what might be on the mantel in your in your uh, family home, or or if you're at university, the things that you have, or like in a residence, the things that you have brought, and those those things that are utilitarian or non-utilitarian objects. Things that you need around you, and the things that are around you are uh, often about um, less their intrinsic value and more the value that they have in locating you and communicating to others um, how you are, uh, who you are, what you, what your life is like. Uh, and it could be fan affiliation. It could be uh, you know your home community. It could be you know pictures of your family and friends and so on and all these things that 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 uh, encompass us. These objects that we have. Uh, but one of the the really interesting things that Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet talks about, and then it's really relevant in Kay's article, uh, Kay's chapter on Marion Sykes, are these um, memory objects, which 
when you, when you have object of memory as a collective for all these things, and then memory object is, as one of the categories within it, there's a little bit of um, uh, word annoyances. But where people create uh, objects that are fundamentally um, turning memory, turning life history into some kind of depiction, some kind of pictorial. Um, uh, Barbara Kirschenbach Gimblet's own father um, became a, a, a painter later in life and, and uh, was reminiscing and painted his uh, pre immigrant childhood before he moved uh, before he moved to Canada his Eastern European Jewish childhood with all the benefits of that and also some of the of course the the, the intense tragedies of because um, he was coming um, he I believe if, if memory serves he was within the beginnings of the Holocaust but was able to um, avoid the camps but I don't want to actually leave that out there because I might be wrong but you know, and but his paintings reflected both the joyousness and occasionally the the the, the intense um, horrors of that time. Um, but they're done in paintings, and so when uh, as you're reading this chapter, you probably realize that it's is ostensibly about rugs, but it's much more importantly about Marion and her life and the way that she's not only telling. But retelling, recasting, reframing, reimagining what her life was, how she's using this strange piece of craft, which is rug hooking, which is not a indigenous Indiana craft. Indigenous in terms of prior to you know the the notion of craft as a hobby, um, um, but it was you know it was an Eastern Coast thing. Uh, Shetta Camp, Newfoundland, pieces of uh, New England that just sort of entered into uh, one of those skills that, um, or one of those crafts that uh, became, commodified isn't the right word, but widespread. It be became sort of disseminated across the United States through seminars, through magazines and so on, and just became a craft that other people could do. She took it up, Marion Sykes took it up when she was 80. So this wasn't something that she did her entire life. She learned it, she was introduced to it by her daughter, uh, and she learned how to do it from magazine, but she'd already been involved in certain kinds of uh, hooking crafts because she could do crochet and she could knit, but particularly the crochet, which has a similar type of needle to to, uh, to rug hooking. But rug hooking takes a, a, a canvas, you draw something upon that canvas, and then using different um, uh, small strips of wool, you poke it through the holes in that canvas. And it's, it's, it's often like burlap, like, a, like the kind of canvas that you wrap uh, potatoes in a burlap uh, pattern and uh, you can just use symbolic patterns or you know like or a leaf you can do geometry and Gerald Potius has this article about hooked rugs in Newfoundland and the difference you know when you use geometric versus where you use figurative um, and I can I can link a little bit to that um, but uh, Marion uh, unlike uh, as you read the chapter um, John talks about how he had seen something about the craft fair and an email had popped up and he went on the website and there was just one, one rug that was different from the others. The others were equally exemplary um, instances of the craft of uh, rug hooking, but hers were narrative. Hers were all over, uh, her, hers were depicting a story. Hers were kind of like, well, they, they were, um, what might be a word for it? I guess uh, they're tableau scenes and that they assume some kind of narrative, that as you look at them, you can see that there are figures, they are located in a specific place, the figures must have some kind of relationship to each other, um, the, the, there's a specific time implied, and even if you don't know precisely what it is, you, the viewer, you are sort of brought into it. And you can perhaps make some sense of it, but the some sense of it is completed by Marion herself. And so, you know, if it's on display in her living room, and he says that she's a little bit shy that her son put up a whole bunch of her rugs in the living room because she looks at them as, she's also looking at them as um, executions of her craft and her previous decisions. And you're like, well, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. I don't know if you do crafts or if you do art of some description. And you are probably your own worst critic. And you, it's like, once it's done, you're like, I don't know about this. And certainly, 
putting things on display is a little bit weird um, uh, when you do it and other people uh, but you, you at the same time when you you want your friends to hang up their stuff because you love your friends stuff when they do it and so it's all you know it's, it's all in turning that self-doubt uh, into the interior so what parts of her life does she review? And that in, in itself is a fundamental, fundamentally important question because she's at this position where, and she's doing this form, both the form of the rug and the form of the stories that she tells when in the presence of the rug, when someone asks and she can then, it becomes the opportunity for narrative. She can be selective. And uh, for one thing, it's going to take months to create. So I like the idea that she says that she doesn't want to have one of her depressing scenes of childhood because um, these things can take months to create. And so she doesn't talk about her own childhood because her own childhood was pretty miserable. She was uh, orphaned and she was raised in a, in a particularly cruel orphanage in, in Chicago. When she got married, the marriage wasn't good, but the lives of her children were. And even if they were in um, modest circumstances, and even though she had to work nights as a waitress, and even though the house was a little bit dilapidated, especially with the deadbeat, that's not fair, she didn't, never uses that word, especially with the husband not contributing much to the uh, renovation of the home. Um, nevertheless, the childhoods, the, um, she worked to make her, her kids' childhood as idyllic as she could, and uh, the interviews that he does with the children seem to reflect that she was successful in that, that, they ha that she gave them happy childhoods, uh, with all the understanding that circumstances were not um, generous. Uh, uh, but comfort was nevertheless given in the, firm, in, in the form of emotional support and so on. And that... Uh, so she depicts these happy scenes, these colorful scenes in, you know, through this very imperfect representational medium of the rug. If she had been doing oil painting or something, maybe she would have picked different scenes. But, you know, one of the cool things is that the medium allows for... There's only so accurate that you can depict with this. It's always going to be figurative. It's going to be like a cartoon. And therefore, it suggests that you don't have to necessarily go towards realism. You're going towards some kind of um, representation that screams um, this is not exactly how things were because the, the, the medium is, is limited. But that's the, where the creative gist comes in. So he goes, he gives a fair amount of detail of various ones. There's that wonderful one of um, uh, sort of, you know, the, 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 there's one about the circus. There's the one trick-or-treating. There's the one at, at the, uh, the lifeguard house and so on, or the lifeguard. Um, the way she makes it, unlike, unlike certain other forms, uh, particularly things like quilting, um, the, the material is just bought through consignment stores. She does it cheaply, she, her, or her daughters buy them for her, and she cuts it up. If she needs to dye it, she can dye it using very basic things like Kool-Aid. Quilts as objects, even if they are figurative and not simply geometric quilts, and not I shouldn't say simply because the geometric quilts are really difficult to make if you've ever quilted, but if they are figurative, um, um, or, or geometric, often the materials themselves have some meaning behind them. They might be repurposed, they might be old shirts, they might be old sheets, they might have a story behind them as well. And uh, Barbara Kirshen Black Gimlet calls those uh, ensembles, where it is the putting together of a number of things into some kind of unified whole, where the individual constituent things have meaning, and yet now they are part of this larger thing. That is not what's happening. This material is store is um, is a uh, well, store bought consignment store bought, and she kind of I guess uh, I'm getting the feeling that she kind of appreciates the idea that the limited range of colors, or rather the the the, the, the range that she has, the, the the color option she has is based more or less on the luck of what is found, as opposed to she could easily go and go to a fabric place and get all the colors that she wants. But that becomes, like all great art, there's a, there's a limiting factor to it, and therefore the creativity is operating within that limiting factor. So the rug kind of announces that this isn't documentary. And so um, when she depicts things like a visit to Little Italy, 
it isn't one particular moment in time. It can be a pastiche of all those those memories. So, um, you know, every trip to Little Italy, every trip to the zoo, every trip to the to um, uh, the White White Pines Park, um, all of those can just sort of be condensed into these one the, this this one image. It doesn't make it less true. It just means that the truth that it is pointing towards is not about some kind of ethnographic moment. That doesn't mean that you can't actually get ethnographic detail and the things that she's pulling out from her memory and putting next to each, uh, next to each other and creating these tableau scenes, conceiving of them as some kind of unified whole, they are expressing something, they are expressing some kind of um, halcyon, but n nevertheless true thing. It's just not necessarily something that has a specific correlate in ontological history. It isn't the same as a photograph. It is deliberately reconstructed, reconceived, uh, and that is part of the art. It is part of the artistry and really it's fundamentally part of the prerogative of, of the elderly as they are, they have that. They can do that with their stories as well in that as they are reviewing um, and as they are recounting, they are, according to their audience and according to the medium of storytelling, they are adjusting events and, and, and creating something that is fundamentally new. So it seems very glib to refer to these as conversation pieces, because a conversation piece seems like a very uh, bourgeois thing where someone picks up an objet from some distant place or something that is idiosyncratic and then you know places it upon their uh places it upon their uh, copy table and like oh ask me about this thing well do i have a story and it's like something about marrakesh or whatever and it's fine you can do that there are more than conversation pieces in that connotation though they are these opportunities for um these opportunities for narrative and you read this chapter and you you can see the art you can you can look at the at the rugs and you can appreciate them as constructs you can appreciate them as pieces of um, meaning making you can uh, appreciate them as um, an, an aesthetic thing you could also appreciate that they were made for the purpose of being displayed and not for the purpose of being a rug because she doesn't really care how lumpy it is because it's never going to be something that someone's going to walk on uh, which is of course you know one of the things where we're distinguishing this these forms that were uh, you know have their origins in the creation of something necessary that had to fulfill its function um, and then having to fulfill its function we can put an aesthetic on it um, so we make a rug because we need a rug um, to do rug stuff with, and then, uh, but while we are doing that, we make it pretty, uh, and we make it say something. Uh, if it's not even going to have that functional thing, it's only because it says something, then you can just sort of shift aside uh, and, you know, not, not care. But the whole point, uh, not care about its functional uh, perfection, and rather care about its, um, it's a communicative uh, perfection or it's communicative aspects because it is just it, this craft arrived in her life just at the time when she was uh, had the leisure, had the retrospect, had the successful f uh, family that was now generating, uh, the next generation, where her responsibilities as mother might have more or less ended, but her now her role as a matriarch of this of this clan is um, being affirmed and reaffirmed, and now is the time for review. And so this is about her stories as much as it is about her art, uh, her ability, her her. Um, her facility with this particular crafting tradition. Um, and it just becomes this wonderful entry point. Uh, the whole book is great, but it becomes this wonderful entry point into conceiving of these pieces of art, conceiving of these objects as subjective, as that they, they 
can exist because they're durable, because they're tangible. I mean, you could break into her house and take it and it would be removed from the, the narrative context and it would still function as an aesthetic device and it would function as an example of a craft. But really, it is difficult to fully appreciate these things without the idea of the context in which they emerge. And this might draw the most attention to it, to this idea that even objects are subjective and that even objects are instances of performance. It might draw the most attention to it because there is clearly a story that is imminent in that object that one needs just another little bit of insight in order to fully complement. Uh, but only a little bit. It's like, it's, it's there. I know something is happening. Uh, but that might be the, the end of the uh, spectrum, uh, the end of the continuum in extremis. But there is, it makes you sort of think that all objects kind of have this. And the handmade object, um, when it, even when it's figurative, even when it seems to suggest more than anything a utilitarianism, there's often a narrative that situates it just that much more in place. Yeah, that's what I want to say. Um, it's great. There are, you can find this book online. Um, uh, I'll, I'll have links in the description. Um, I don't have anything else to say. So I have been talking, I'm actually probably less talking and more gushing about my friend John Kay's Marion Sykes, Recalling Memories and Making Rugs. Uh, as ever, my friends, I'm Ian. I wish you nothing but the best, and be well, and bye-bye.